So in your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. If you're not sure where it is, then hopefully your neighbor knows where it is. Not John the Gospel. 1 John, which is towards the end. If you're there, say I'm there. If you're not, say help. <laughs> if someone next to you said help, please, please help them. My Bible does not want to stay open. Did I say we're not in a rush? Yeah, or, good. Let's hang out. Yeah, let's hang out in the Bible. <laughs> Everyone's there? Good? That which was from the beginning. Okay, context. Everyone say context. This letter, or these letters, there's 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. This is the same writer from the Gospel of John. This is the same writer of the book of, someone say it, Revelations. Remember last week, I spoke for like a whopping like 13 minutes, and I mentioned uh, the Apostle John and how he was like around 17 to like 21 years old when he started following Jesus and the impact that he had and how he had the craziest revelation uh, on the island of Patmos. Who remembers this? Please remember it. Thank you. So that is the John, the, the, the John that as Jesus is on the cross moments before his de- death, he looks at Mary, his mother, and says, Mary, this is now your son, John. And he looks at John and says, John, this is now your mother, Mary. Even, even in the midst, his last breaths, he's taking care of his mother. Amen? Amen. We should take care of our mother like that. If only there was like a day for mothers coming up. (laughs) The same John who takes care of, the same John that Jesus entrusts with his mother, the same same John that Jesus entrusts with the revelation of the end of the world. He's the one writing these words, and I I found it kind of interesting. uh, um, um, Can you guys change the TV in the back just so it helps me? this is the same John writing this letter, and he starts this letter. This is the first chapter. Like this is, he doesn't say like, "Hey, friends, how's it going?" or to the church here. No, it's 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 a declaration saying that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Did I did I mention we're having a Bible study? Ask yourselves questions when you read the Bible. Don't just, because it's easy for, and, I, and I've done it so many times, where I will read this chapter, I'll get a couple of takeaways, but I don't understand it. I'll take little nuggets here and there. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but when you read something and it doesn't make sense, strive for it to make sense. John saying that which was from the beginning. The question is, wait, what, what is that that he's talking about? Because that is a subject, but he doesn't tell us what the subject is. I guess following along? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. So John, speaking of his own testimony, he's like, okay, that which was from the beginning. Number one, we heard it. Number two, which we have seen with our eyes. Number three, which we have looked upon. And four, and our hands have handled concerning the, what are those three words? Word of life. Stay on the first verse, my, my good friend back there. See, John here, he doesn't say, that which, which, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning Jesus Christ. That's not what he says. He says the word of life. In other words, he's referring to the word of life as, as someone that he heard, someone that he saw, and someone that he handled. In other words, he is equating, synonymous, the word of life is Jesus. This is all in the first verse. Two, verse two. The life, the life was manifested. 
He doesn't even get to the word Jesus until, until uh, the end of verse 3. But the whole time, think about it, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus, the word of life, verse 2, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father. Again, he's saying and he's speaking that eternal life is a person. He's saying eternal life itself was manifested in the person of Jesus. So, so far we are seeing that Jesus is, number, he is the word of life. Number two, he is eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Verse three, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, I'm going to say truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. In this, for in, in this, in verse four, John gives us context to why he is writing this letter. In the next chapter, he gives us more context to why he's writing the letter. And if we have time, we'll get there. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. In other words, if you're liking joy, this is a good letter to read. You know what, Skip, we'll, we'll jump to it real quick. We'll reference it. Um, stay there in your Bibles. But if you guys can put up chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1 says this. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. So we, we already see two reasons why John writes this letter. Oh, I, hope, I hope you guys start to get this. He's giving you answers. He's saying, hey, this is what's in this letter. Number one, I'm writing these things, and if you read them, your joy will be full. Second reason, my little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. In other words, if you read this letter and you grasp it, and you feed on it, and you internalize it, like little children, you're not going to sin. Now, John doesn't say little children like saying that you're a child. Like, he's not speaking down to you. No, no, he's talking about the attitude of a little child. We just had a little child. His cheeks are getting big. I want to pinch the heck out of him. I do, well, I don't pinch the heck out of him. But I pinch both of them at the same time. It's the greatest thing ever. I'm going to do that for the rest of his life. I really am. And here's something that, that, that you become aware of. You become really aware of the words you say. You become, a, you, become of, you become aware of what you're speaking over them. And I'm really proud of my wife because she is hypersensitive to everything that is spoken into our home. She does everything she can. She, she is vigilant in making sure that we speak life and only speak life. As a matter of fact, we've had, like, we, we've had, we, we have, uh, as a team, I think, <laughs> um, we try to shut down people saying, oh, he's sleeping now, but oh, just wait until, and we're like, no, 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 she does, she does, she, she does a great job, she's bold. She's like, nope, not my child, nope, not, because people will just, uh, and it's so funny, because once, as Pastor Drew has been preaching about like, the, the power of the tongue, you become more aware, more sensitive to like, wow, like, people say a lot of dumb stuff. Yeah. Like, when we testify of the goodness of God in that my wife was praying for a sleeping baby. We're like, hey, our baby sleeps like seven, eight hours every single night. And people are like, just wait, just wait. And we're like, no, it's not going to happen. Don't speak that over our child. Yeah. He loves sleep. He loves to sleep. He loves sleep. He loves to sleep in our house. Say, say it again. In our house. Well, anywhere. <laughs> He's sleeping right now. One of the reasons why we're so hypersensitive to words is because as a little child, you internalize a lot of things. It's really easy for a little child to internalize. Me, at six years old, it was really easy for words to affect me. Right now, not so much, because I understand. I've, I, I've developed um, <laughs> thick skin, right? 
but I can remember clearly at six years old, and if I think about it, it still hurts. But I can think about at six years old, someone that I looked up to telling me to leave them alone because I'm harassing them. See, those words that were spoken to me when I was six years old, I internalized those like they're in me and had to work really hard to get that stuff out. It's really easy for me, as a child, it was really easy for us to absorb things that were spoken over us. You're an idiot. You're stupid. You're always like this. You're always like that. You're never going to be this. You're never going to be that. And these are all words as, as, as children that we've internalized. And if we don't handle that, it manifests itself. Those words bear fruit. Now imagine as a little six-year-old, someone speaking the word of God over me and telling me who I was in Christ, and I internalized that. That's what John's talking about. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. In other words, you read this letter with the heart and the attitude of a child where you just believe and you jump in and you wholeheartedly receive everything that is spoken in this letter. You're not going to sin and your joy will be full. Amen? Amen? Okay, so back to chapter 1. So that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. John is declaring what he has seen and, and what he has heard. And he is someone who was very close. He's known as John the Beloved. He is the one who was reclining against Jesus' chest in, 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 at the Last Supper. I love you. Sorry, I had to take that moment because we don't get a lot of those moments these days. <laughs> but it's a great season we're in. It's a really good season. We wouldn't trade her for anything, right? So verse 5, This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. As I was reading, I was meditating on this. When we fellowship with the Lord, we receive his life. When we fellowship with the Lord, we receive his life. This is why when you get in, in, into a good routine, into a good discipline of like reading your Bible every day and praying every day and coming to church, like you feel good. You're like, wow, like this is good. Like I, I feel like I'm in, um, I'm in like the zone, right? You feel like you're on, good, you're on a good uh, track. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's because you're constantly spending time with Jesus through the word, through prayer, through worship, through serving. And what are you doing? You're receiving that light. You're receiving that life. That he is. But when you pull back from Jesus and you don't spend a lot of time with him, in other words, you reduce your fellowship with Christ and you increase your fellowship with the world, you start to get a little bit of darkness in you. And eventually that darkness can grow. Now, I'm not here to say that you have to cut off everything secular from your life. That's not my heart. Listen to the heart of God. The heart of God is, if you fellowship with me, you'll receive life. And when you fellowship with the world, you receive emptiness. Listen to me. One of the greatest lies in a generation is that you can fellowship with other people through social media. It's not true. You ever notice you hang out with someone, you feel like energized, revitalized, like, wow, I really love hanging out with these people. Right? Like, I really love hanging out because I, I feel so full. I feel like they add to my life. You don't feel that after scrolling for two hours. 
You don't feel that. You don't feel satisfied and complete. You feel like, man, what did I just do for two hours? Why is it one in the morning? Exactly. See, the, 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 we very, in an empty way, empty results, we fellowship with social media, we fellowship with media and entertainment. It does not produce life in us. It does not give us life. There's only one form of media that gives life, and that is a book, and that is the Bible. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. But in order for us to receive that cleansing and that forgiveness, we cannot downplay our sin. We cannot cover our sin. We can't say that, we can't say that our sin is no big deal. If you think that your sin is no big deal, you, it's a really big stronghold because Satan has convinced you that sinning is okay with the Lord. He's convinced you that you can sin and still be okay. But you all know that struggle. I love you guys. But we all have that. You guys have all felt that struggle where you're like, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. And the moment you come up to worship, all of a sudden you're faced with everything you did in the week. And you cannot worship comfortably. That is the moment that is the moment where instead of trying to cover our sin, we lay it down and say, Lord, you see me as I am, and I need you to cleanse me. Say, so forgive, forgive and cleanse. We need both, church. We need both. And some of us, help us, help us, Lord. Some of us, we want the forgiveness so we can sin again. We want the forgiveness just so we can feel better. But we're not sure if we want to be cleansed from our sin. Because here's the thing. When we are truly cleansed from our sin, we no longer, there's no longer the stain. There's no longer the consequence. There's no longer the stronghold. When, when the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all unrighteousness, you are now righteous. And your desires begin to change. And your appetite begins to change. Amen? Amen. This is good stuff, man. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. His word. I love the accuracy of the Bible. I love how clear the Bible is. We are the ones who complicate God. Oh, I don't know where I'm at with God, or oh, I'm not sure what God thinks about this, or oh, I'm not, you know, I feel like God is silent. You're overcomplicating it. According to John, you just fellowship with the Lord and you receive life. If you feel like there's any places in your life that are dead, you got to spend some time with the one who's alive. Amen? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It, it, it doesn't say that, oh, that you don't... John doesn't say... That we're a liar because we don't go to church. He didn't say it's because we don't pray enough. He didn't say because we didn't come up for the altar call. No, he says because his word, his word, you guys are all holding his word. His word needs to be in us. Amen. Church, his word will cause us not to sin. I'm going to say it again. His word will cause us not to sin. If you're entrapped in something, if you're struggling with something, you need more of the word. Because the word is life and the word is light. Because the word is light, you will see where the traps are. Because the word is light, it will expose the traps of the enemy. 
and you won't be asking yourself, how did I get into this situation again? You're not going to say that because you're going to see it. The word is life. So there's, there won't be, when you're, when, when you're fellowshipping with the word of life, there won't be room for depression. There won't be room for anxiety. There won't be room for sadness. There won't be room for loneliness. Fill yourself up with Jesus, and I promise you, there won't be any room for anything else. Amen? And it takes getting over yourself. It really does. It takes you going home tonight and saying, you know what? I'm no longer going to scroll. I'm no longer going to watch. I'm no longer going to text. I'm just going to say, you know what? Shut, shut up, flesh. I want to spend time with God whether my flesh likes it or not because I know it will produce fruit. And that's what I need in my life. I don't need to be numb with media. I need life in me. I don't, want to, I don't want my insides to pass away slowly to the point where I wake up one day and I'm just like, I just feel gray. No, I need some color in my life. I need some life in me. Amen? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not with us. I am saying. <laughs> Chapter 2. Good Bible study? It's a great letter, guys. And the, listen, the more you read this letter, the more it will give you life. There's so much depth in this letter. So verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if, I want to say if, We've quoted it all the time. He doesn't say when you sin. John does not expect that you will sin. But he's like, ah, just in case, though. Just in case. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the appropriation for our sins. Someone would say, what's appropriation? What's Raise your hand if you know what that means. Your squinting eyes say no, even though your hand says yes. Here's what appropriation means. And, 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 it's, and, and we need to see Jesus rightly, and we need to see ourselves rightly. And here's what I mean by that. John says that Jesus is appropriation for our sins. And it's not like... As some people have said, and it, I'm not, it's not wrong, I just want to get it right. Does that make sense? Where people are like, oh yeah, like God's no longer angry with me. God's no longer angry with you. You know, he loves you now. That's not exactly what it means. It means that he was angry with you because he's just. He's angry with you because he's holy. But instead of him pouring out his anger on you, he poured it out on Jesus. That's what the appropriation of our sins is. It means we deserved the wrath of God. There was no way around it. It's not like God was like, oh yeah, like, I'm just, I'm just going to not pour my wrath on you. Jesus died on the cross, and he forgives you, so we're good now. He's like, no, no, no. He's a holy God, and his wrath had to be poured out in order for us to be right with him. So on the cross, the sacrifice of Jesus, he laid himself down for us. And God's wrath had to be poured out. Listen, his love and his wrath are the same. You cannot separate the two. And a lot of people do. It's like, oh yeah, God's no longer angry with you, but he, so now he loves you. No, no, he loves you so much. He loved you so much that he decided to pour his wrath out on his son Jesus instead of you. Amen? Yeah. So that's what appropriation means. So verse 2, and he himself is the appropriation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Verse 3, now by this we know that we know him. How do I know if I'm saved? How do I know if I know Jesus? Well, John has that answer, amen? amen. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. No way around it, guys. No way around it. You cannot have your own life in the world and have fellowship with him. You can't. Sorry to ruin it for you. God doesn't like does, God will not share you. He tells Moses, I'm a jealous God. 
I don't want the world to have you. I don't want this. I don't want sin to have you. I don't want sickness to have you. I don't want depression and anxiety to have you. I don't want the world's money system to have you. I don't want popularity to have you. I want to have you. All of you. Not part of you. All of you. Now, by this we know him. By this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. Verse 4. He who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word. God help them. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Again, the Bible is very clear. John doesn't say that the love of God is perfect in him. It's perfected. It's a process, right? We don't get saved and all of a sudden we love everyone. (laughs) Some people are more challenged to love, right? But they challenge us to be more like Christ. When people challenge you, they're challenging you you to be more like Christ. Amen? And here's the truth. You have the love of God. And as the love of God is being perfected in you, it just means that more of your flesh is dying. Amen? That is good. Good Bible study? Man, I can keep going. You guys want a little more? Do you want a little more, Sister Bell? He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever... Uh, again, let's be clear and let's be concise. John doesn't say that they know the truth. A lot of us know the truth and we don't follow it. He says, no, the truth is in him. It's internal. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. How do we know if we're in him? If we keep his word. If we keep his word. How do we keep his word? You, you fellowship with the word. That's how you keep it. If you, don't, you, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't spend time in the word, it, it will dissipate in you. If you don't fellowship with the world, with the world, if you don't fellowship with the word, the world will suck it out. And your conscience will be seared and you won't even be sensitive to sin anymore. Fellowshipping with the word keeps us sensitive to sin, keeps us sensitive to the influence of the enemy. If we don't know the word, we become dull. Here's what happens when we don't know the word. When we don't know the word, Satan will get you to compromise. If you do not internalize the word, in other words, if you don't believe it like you should, Satan can say, hey, did God really say that you would die? Or is God keeping something from you? In other words, you you will be deceived when you don't know the word. Verse 6, this is good. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is good. He who says he abides in him. In other words, he who says that I, I live in Jesus. If that is your confession, it means this is how, is how it's expressed. If my confession is that I live in Christ, here's what you will see without me saying I live in Christ. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Amen? Amen. I'm going to say it again. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. If the youth band can come up. That's you guys. I mentioned, right, that this is a Bible study. 
I hope that the way I read to you guys tonight, this is how I study the Bible. You just take your time, right? We read a whole, we read a whole chapter together and a part of a second chapter. We got a lot of good stuff out of it, right? We got a lot of good stuff. A lot of good revelation. A lot of Jesus. They didn't take long at all. And it's life to us. Amen? Fellowship with his word. Paul says that the word of God is alive. It's active. It's powerful. Stop seeing the Bible as a book. See it as the words of life that it is. And if there's anything going on in your life that you're not sure about, if there's anything going on, it's not cliche, guys. Cliche will diminish what this is. When I, if, if I say right now, oh yeah, the answer's in here, the cliche is like, oh yeah, everyone says that. You know, Jesus is the answer. It's like, no, you don't understand the depth. It's not, it, it's not so much about, oh yeah, Jesus has the answer, Jesus is the answer. It's like, no, like, we have the answer to everything and he already gave it to us. And we are the ones who are dumb for not finding it, for not seeking it. Every situation that you're going through, every thought that you're struggling with, every emotion that you are struggling with, it needs two things. It needs life and it needs, and it needs light. Yeah. And the Word of God is both of those things. Amen?